Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, John Wells to the stage. Uh, as we give him a round of applause, I'd also like to suggest that one of the things we did at DevOps Days Oslo uh, l last month was that every time a speaker takes a, a drink from a glass of water, it's nice to give him a little clap, <laughs> just to keep the, keep the spirit going. So got no water. Yeah, yeah get, get this man some water. Heck yeah. Um, hey, yeah, no, I think um, the funny story, so um, I've been working on this idea, for lack of a better term, called DevOps Automated Governance for like five years, and I'll go through the story. But, um, really, I could not find a vendor that I thought did what we were sort of driving and building. And I was building this with some of the biggest industry people. I mean, these people that, like, if you had a product, they would have known about it. And uh, and I run into Mike at Open Spaces, and you know, I'm saying, I don't think anybody does this. And he goes, we do. I'm like, OK, here we go, another joker that I'm going to have to beat down. And I'm like, do you do this? And he goes, yeah, we do that. I'm like, all right, do you do this? He's like, and I'm like, okay, maybe I better come over to your booth and find out what you're doing. <laughs> so yeah, that's how the, so we started with a fight. So he's a good bloke, he, he, didn't, he didn't hold it against me. All right, so the, the, the book, right, um, I, you know, the, the thing is, I'm not like gonna sell you the book. I, what I wanna do is tell you the, the interesting story of why the book became to be. Um, and it really was sort of, an, it's sort of an industry industry problem trying to be solved by some people who had this problem. Um, the people who wrote the book, um, you know, I forgot to do this, so I was going to set my timer. Um, you, you know, they, they, they Helen Beale was, you know, did massive work at Lloyd's of London. Um, Bill Bensing did um, the, um, what's something called Dead Sword, what was one of the biggest DOD dev SecOps projects in Department of Defense. Um, Jason Cox runs basically all commercial properties at Disney. Uh, John Rez, Topo Powell's first fellow at Capital One. I mean, this, this is like, I, I think I calculate 150 years worth of experience in this book. And, and although, though it's a fictional story, I mean, they're all basically true stories. Um, it, just quickly, I mean, like, I've done a lot of things. I think it's about 12 books, um, somewhere in that neighborhood of like 10 or 12 startups, most of them um, disastrous flaming burnouts, um, but um, hopefully that's not the case with Cosley, but, <laughs> uh, but I've had a couple of wins, um, you know, sort of recently. I sold a company to Docker, I sold a company to Dell. In fact, that's when my mother-in-law finally is like, oh, now I get what you do. You know, she could never figure it out until I said sold a company to Dell, so. Yes. Um, Devil's Handbook. The Green Book is the one we're going to really focus in on, you know, which led us to this one, and, and I've had a 10-year Sort of my my um, white whale, if you will, is a Deming book that should be done at the end of this year. So, uh, ten years I've been working on that. So that'll be out there pretty soon. So this is the book. Um, depending when you hit enter, it could be number one, number eight, number ten in some category um, of the book, the Investments Unlimited. Um, it, 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 I think it's important to talk about the people that I think are. I mean, there are certainly the nine authors, um, but there, um, for me, um, Toba Powell. You know, brilliant, unbelievable, egoless, brilliant person. You know, you go search some of his presentations, a physicist who became a computer person. And, and me and him around 2017 were just working with Gene Kim, Phoenix Project Oil, and, and we were just having this conversation about how terrible internal audit and IT risk is and the low efficacy. And, and um, you know, one day we, over a bunch of beers, we said blockchain, you know, and like, nope, uh, sorry. He came back and reported back when you mentioned blockchain in a large bank, it gets taken away from you back in 2017. <laughs> so, um, and then uh, we wrote this paper and the, the guy in the middle, John Rostowski, literally went back after we wrote the book and uh, built a system. And, you know, I became a mentor for that. So they, they, these two guys were pretty instrumental in, in the story that leads up to this novel. And so uh, the other thing is Gene Kim, um, you know, basically invites about 40 or 50 of us to Portland every year. You know, in the pandemic, it was virtual. And we work on these papers, you know, research papers. We break out into groups. And back in 2015, and it is all Creative Commons. They're all out there. There's like 100 papers, not just security. It's everything DevOps, all industry leaders. It's an unbelievable resource, uh, sort of resource. But we wrote something. We wanted to, to sort of discuss the idea of like separation of duties and like that you could redefine the definition of that with DevOps, right? So, and that's that's a well-told story already. But, but the one that was really fun in 2018, we we did uh, Dear Auditor, and uh, I'll talk a little more about that. But it was sort of a tongue-in-cheek apology letter to the auditors. 
And at the end, it was about another 10 to 15 pages of actually a risk control matrix, which we really defined. And that led us to this, uh, this conversation about could we do something like a blockchain-ish way to, um, to do the evidence the attestations, the controls, the gates of the way we deliver software. And that book, then we'll go into, became the Investments Unlimited, which was supposedly going to be version two of that. So um, the, the risk control matrix in, in Dear Audit is interesting. Um, you can see real quick, um, these are the, there's like 53 risks, but um, the, the 10 categories, and you can see the PAM, the SAD, the SBOM, the DAR. But the one that sort of woke us up, uh, Topo and I, was the number eight, you know, the divergence of audit evidence from developer evidence, right? That was the thing that sort of just stuck out, right? Like that's part of the low efficacy, high toil of what we do in audit in a lot of, large, especially in large banks, but certainly everywhere. And so we sat down and to this green book I've been talking about, which was like, okay, if we're going to do this thing, what, what's our sort of goal and objective? It is, well, we certainly want to shorten the audit time. You know, most large banks, most large anythings do 30, 40 days a year, even as we speak today, doing audits. Um, and the, effic the, uh, the audit efficacy is terrible, right? You know, I've gone into CIOs and, you know, uh, done, like spent time doing like qualitative analysis for their organization. And how do we do, John? Like terrible, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, and because you look at the subjective nature of the way you, the audits are and the real data, I mean, we, we could spend a whole the next hour talking about how terrible that is. And then ultimately, it's a trust model. Like, why do we have cabs? Because we haven't built the right trust. So this were, these were the three primitives that we were going into this thing on. And so we, wrote, we sat down and we, you know, what started out as a reference architecture, which was, you know, we wanted to increase the efficacy uh, while reducing the toil with the key of the, you know, the whole blockchain conversation started this idea that, you know, it, maybe it's not going to be blockchain, but it, it's going to be a model that turns an automated model that turns subjective evidence into, I mean, you know, subjective into objective evidence. You know, we say subjective attestation is into, so like, the, it, you know, throw away the fancy words, but basically a ServiceNow record that says, blah, 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 I did this, blah, 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 I did that, here's a screen fit, blah, 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 go look at the lock, right, to um, digitally signed attestations that are mutable and non-terrible that are completely automated, right? How about that? And so the idea then is, okay, what do we do? Traditionally, we, um, you know, so we move from sort of manual gates to continuous checks. Like we turn 30 to 40 day audits into zero days. Hit enter and see what the world looks like. Um, we go from checklist to risk controls as code. So the idea is we start um, building an abstraction layer for our code um, in that, like, you know, the idea, like, what drives me nuts is when I talk to second lines, I, I was just speaking to a large Asian bank three weeks ago, and the guy was telling me, he was second line, he used to be first line, now he's second line, three lines of defense, right? And, and he says, this manager came to him and said, why are you looking at code? Why are you always in the weeds? And he said, because I don't trust the second line's data. I mean, first line, sorry, first line's data, right? Like, so there's a, just a broken trust model. And um, so we moved to sort of a, you know, this idea of a DSL-like function where it's human readable, machine interpretable, inversion controlled. So that the, what we say we want to do is what happens. And here's the real key. Because once we have an abstraction, and we move away from telling second line to look at like sneak logs or uh, open control or Kubernetes logs. We have this abstraction. So now second line can actually get into designer requirements. And you can agree now on a sort of a, a construct of these are the things and they're trusted. If I tell you that, that, that there's a trusted perimeter that says it has to be 80% test coverage, the, the second line doesn't have to go look at a sonic cube lock. And by the way, that's, we don't want that to happen, right? And so, um, and they become self-documented because now the agreement is on the, the, the sort of the primitive in the DSL, right? So now we build this level of trust. It's not like, you know, like why did I fail the audit or why did you do this? Give me the screen print. It's like we agree that this is the sort of, this, the construct of the agreement, and, and again, at that point, we get to arbitrate over whether the construct is correct or not. We don't have to argue about, like, you know, that this is the risk control. I don't understand how to give you that data. 
Um, and then last but not least is this is the thing that gets most interesting. Once you build that level of trust through this abstraction, you then actually see, and like this is little, warms my heart for doing this um, 40 years now. <laughs> That's pretty scary. Um, that you start seeing this uh, increase of what are called self-identified risks. So now what you have is developer and operations, instead of being sort of um, reactive or uh, don't tell auditors that, you know, we like, oh, like don't explain that to them because that's going to add another five days. They're actually going back to second line and saying, hey, I think I got another idea that we should probably put into a risk control. They're being creative um, you know, because now they're sort of, they understand why we're doing this. So you know you've like really broken down the wall of confusion when that happens. And so in that green book, we tried to sit down um, and think about what are the stages so we, if you think about it, we're going to try to create, you know, immutable data, train subjective to objective. Um, you know, how do we think about the world in terms of, like, stages where we can build common controls and actors? And uh, so this is just three examples, like uh, risk control on computer scanning. Now, some of them might be pass-fail. Some of them might be percentage-based, right? So, like, for example, if I could put in a DSL that says that, you know, that all dependencies is built for a container must pass. Right, and and so now this is that's pretty straightforward. If today it's Sneak and tomorrow it's Aquasec and in it's some other fancy product that doesn't exist yet, doesn't matter. You can plug and play those because the abstraction and agreement between second and first line is already, a, you know, a, a, so a transaction. Um, and then a risk control is like something like um, not only that it had TDD coverage and it passed, but maybe it's a percentage. Like we want 70% pass coverage for this particular application. And then, um, you know, something like a leaky, looking, a ski, it was scanned for secrets. But again, the key is the abstraction, which is the DSL, where we can trust that the source is non-tamperable. So we don't have to have conversations about, you know, well, how did you do that? Well, I used Sneak. Well, how do I know if Sneak did the right thing? You know, here's the log. I had one second line tell me that the answer in the ServiceNow record was appointed to the code in GitHub. Right? Like, like, I mean, that's not the way we should be doing business. Um, this is a longer list that we tried to address in the book, um, the first book, the green book, but you can see some of the. But what gets interesting is, remember I talked about self-identified risk? You know, it, in one of the sort of um, compliance, like a PSI DSS or, or even a HIPAA, like cyclomatic complexity might not be a thing that basically is there. But it does make the code stronger. It does create behavior changes. And it really does make you safer. You know, um, you know and even like sort of chain size or branching strategy, right? Um, what you find is not only do you sort of um, you, you get self in increase, but you start seeing the behavior changes. I had one bank where for years they were trying to convince people to be active in TDD. And once they actually started putting these on a graph in front of everybody, all these teams started raising their hand, hey, can we get that training for test-driven development, right? Um, you know, container scanning. So we did it for each of the stages. Um, and then, um, you know, so the idea is, um, you know, we had original prototype of sort of a YAML-based, but, you know, coming into Costly, you know, when I, when I saw what Costly was doing, I was like, okay, good, I don't have to do another startup. I'm 63, I'm getting too old for this game. Um, and it was just a couple of minor missing pieces, and not even missing, they just, you know, um, but even this week, some of the stuff that we accomplished, John, you want to raise your hand? I mean, that, so, like, I mean, I, we started out with the concept, of, you know, working with the bank of a pure YAML-based DSL, and we're going to get there, I think, pretty quick based on what we even accomplished in one week. But, but being able to just take the Costly... Um, command line interface, we already accomplished basically an in investments unlimited demo this week, starting on Monday, right? So that's how powerful the product is, um, you know. And but again, human readable, machine interpretable, version control—that's an artifact now. The actual artifact that is this abstraction, this DSL, whatever you want to call it, is part of. The, it is an attestation along with all the other things. So if in a month from now it changes. You know, like the, the rules change or, you know, there's a new executive auditor. Like, we can go back and we can say, well, it was this way when this was deployed, but it was this way when it was deployed. Um, and then, you know, you probably have seen, and Mike will do a great presentation later of, you know, sort of how, you know. And the other thing I liked about Cosley, too, which is I've always looked at this as a bottom-up approach, 
right? Like the, you know, how, you know, I, I need to gather all this data in the pipeline and throw it into some basically a Merkle tree or just some type of non tamperable data. Um, oh, five minutes, holy crap. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, anyway, Mike will do the rest there. <laughs> um, <laughs> but this is important. This is a place I want to get to really fast with our, um, what we're doing at Cosley because this is what we were doing at the bank is if we have that DCL and the, we have all those sort of attestation and gates, I want to put this screen in. Um, you know, in Bamboo or, or Travis or Circle CI or you know any of the so the developer's right there. There's no confusion about when the when the, when the developer sees a red, they know that they did it with design requirements with the level, the the you know the, the the second line, and it takes them right to the DSL or it takes them right to the failure. Um, anyway, the 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 company. Um, the, the, you know, the whole sort of narrative is this small investment company, and they're about to fail um, uh, an audit, basically. Um, and the, the CEO gets this sort of notification from, in the U.S., it's called the OCC, and, they, you know, basically if they fool around, they'll lose their license, and they get everybody together. Um, and then there's a, it's based on the Phoenix Project style, so there's a sort of, there's a Socratic dialogue, there's a sort of somebody who sort of helps everybody understand. And I love, one of my favorite lines in the book is, your DevOps has failed you. In other words, DevOps is, a lot of people have done incredible work with DevOps, but they forgot to take security along, right? And then he had to explain to them that they needed to do a lot more work. There's an interesting story around Equifax, I'll tell, maybe I'll do that in the next presentation. But like, here's the, um, the org chart. And one of the things we tried to purposely is create a confusing org chart in this fictional company, right? Because, and, and it's not, the reason I point out the, uh, I'm going to have to steal a couple minutes, sorry, Mike. The reason I point out the Equifax, Equifax is a classic example because the CSAR reported a chief legal officer. And so when, uh, when the U.S., you know, so they lost like five billion market cap because of a breach, right? And when the uh, U.S. Congress did an investigation on the breach, they interviewed the CISO, and the first question they asked CISO is, when you went to work for Equifax, did you think it was odd that you were reporting to the chief legal officer? She said, yes, but I figured they knew what you're doing. But here's the really scary question. They asked her, when you knew that the PII was breached and the data was breached, why didn't you contact the CIO? And the answer was, they didn't think about it. Well, because that, that's what happens when you have an org chart. When you have the chief uh, risk compliance officer reporting the CEO, the CISO reporting, and the CIO reporting the CEO, you've created three silos. And, and, and this is not uncommon in most corporations. By definition, you've created a sort of a Conway's law for security, if that makes sense. Um, and so there's Bill, and you know, they get the MRAs. And what was the other interesting thing, too, which was um, that the, um, we made up the story of this company having these, what they call matters requiring attention, which are basically notifications from the OCC that you're doing bad things. You've failed investigations. They had 15, in our store we had, there were 15 of them, and an MRIA is like, hey, we're pretty pissed right now. Uh, it means you get a matter requiring immediate attention. And, um, and, and so we made this story, and the CEO gets it in like all hands, the CEO doesn't screw around. Um, but Halfway through the book, we found out there's a true story. Exactly, it was uh, Mitsubishi had a North American bank that actually had 15 open C MRAs, got an MRA, ignored it, and got a cease and desist, and was not. In the banking business, when you get a cease and desist, you're no longer a bank. Um, so the good news is they go ahead and they figure out how to, you know, hero's journey. They figure out how to fix it. They start small. They pick out like eight different attestations and gates. This is the demo we built this week. Um, and, and here's another just fun thing about demos, right? Like that demo in, demoing 101. So in the book, again, like this is all experience. They do the demo. Everybody's, imagine you're in a room and we finally get out of the room like, I think we're going to fix this. We're going to do this digitally signed attestation stuff and everything works. And everybody's like, big deal. <laughs> so it's like, wait a minute, you got to do a demo where it breaks. You know, so we forced the break, you know, the, where the checksum failed on, a, on an image. And uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, John. That was great. Um, we're going to have a, a little break now, grab a coffee, get some pastries, uh, relax. We're going to and start in 15 minutes. One thing I would like to say is that 